have been banished. So in other words, it's, 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 it's really problematic for heterosexual babies too, okay? This imposition of, of heteronormativity, you know, in the way that Yep defines it, it's like, you know, it's very narrow. Um, but the heterosexuality itself doesn't get banished. In other words, you know, later in life you may have problems in your heterosexual relationships, but you're not having a pro you the, the fact that you're heterosexual has not been banished out of your body to have to be reclaimed. Whereas you have the right to exist. Right, right. Whereas for the lesbian, it, this is like, you know, I think Clint, you said it really eloquently. It's like it's been banished. And how does it get reclaimed? How does it how do we come back into our bodies? Uh, and, and I think, you know, doing psychological work and depth work means having to feel these early states. And nobody wants to do that. It's like, I know why I had to get cancer before I could feel them. <laughs> you know, I mean, I've been working hard for a long time, but it's like, no way do I want to feel this level of, you know, the level of trauma in this, in this baby who is, feels so unseen and untouched. Yeah, she, she is. Oh, okay, go ahead. Um, what I would wonder about is, <clears throat> is in that first year of that bonding and that interchange, um, there's going to be a lot of different negative messages that could come in from the mother for, for various reasons. She's tired, she's sleeping the baby that day, or she, the baby's kept her up all night, so she's not feeling so positive. So there'll be other negative messages, and there could be the exclusion of the um, uh, lesbian message. But I still think if there's enough good um, reflection and mirroring, you might leave that part out as you leave other parts. But because I, I just, I, I, my belief might be that the damage is later in life than in that first year. The damage would be there if it's just a parent who can't mirror very well. You will not exist. An infant will not exist if there's not been mirroring. Right, right. And well, it's that's okay to so feel it that way. But I'm sort of I'm sort of saying in the case of a gay child, and if you're uh, the case of a gay child that um, not getting mirrored in this place. In other words. Being seen like you're heterosexual um, is, is a form of trauma. And it takes place. It takes place early. It's pre-verbal, it's non-verbal, and it's going to show up in various kinds of body kinds of states. Um, but uh, so I don't know one. one way to talk to think about this is that um, the there's a, there's a point where perhaps we all agree that the parent needs to mirror the child around their growing sexuality. And in that sense, whether we, you know, we can argue about does it happen in eight months or 15 months or, or 23 months, but the question is, is the parent prepared whenever we decide, you know, where does that, where does that become actually relevant in a, in a bi biological way, then the question is, is the parent prepared for that experience. And if the mother comes from this heteronormative stance, then even if these things might be somewhat subtle at the very beginning, there's still the problem that all of a sudden, she, she can't just all of a sudden be marrying of her lesbian daughter. You know, that there has to be, um, a, 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 and just as in any maternal relationship, there has to be a, a development into relatedness. Well, I want to say something else about this, Roger. I want to say that there's a profound prohibition against saying that somebody five years old is gay. Oh, yeah. Okay? We're not allowed to do that. No. If a parent says, oh, look at my little lesbian daughter who's three years old, she's going to get shamed. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that's... Or, yeah, or so proud be... Or reported to DCFS. Well, that the person, that the parent is... Um, <laughs> Predetermining, you know. predetermining, and I, you know, and that's a double standard. See, I want to say heterosexuality is predetermined. Nobody ever says, like, how can you look how cute Johnny and Susie are together, two years old, kiss, kiss. Maybe Nobody says there's a problem with that, day. huh? Maybe they'll get married. Nobody says that, okay? But you've got two little girls holding hands. It's like, look how cute Susie and Judy are. Maybe they'll be lovers someday. <laughs> how dare you? How dare you? That's what I'm talking about. And that's ubiquitous. You know, even really the point 
we may even, you may, the lesbian parents may be even more hypersensitive to not doing that. You know, to, to not encouraging gayness. So, you know, this, this is the point yeah, here. But, but the point is that you're saying these, I'm just saying these children where there is the worst damage, you're even saying it, is that they're older, they're holding hands, they're not infants. But it's like the, um, where the damage is, where they're actually, let's say boys are trying on at one and a half to mommy's clothes. That, that's overt damage that's happening. To them? To if, if the mommy little, mommy girl, uh, little girls try on mommy's clothes, it's okay. Boys trying on mommy's clothes, it's not okay. Little girls try on... You mean they're going to get shamed. You say because yeah. that child will get shamed. Yeah, and it's very overt. Yeah. Whether well, right, but I, I think... Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well... I would recommend moving on. Yeah, we're going to move on here. Um, but I... Because the, there's a point I want to make about all of this vis-a-vis -vis, like doing psychotherapy with with gay clients and lesbian clients um, and, and what that, what, how all this shakes out here. Yeah, Cheryl. I, I was just going to say that really, and I know, I know we want to move on, so I won't, I won't belabor the point, but what happens here is the communication of how mom manages anxiety, her own anxiety. Baby's screaming, she doesn't know what she wants, and it's, that gets communicated pre-verbal. This is how mom manages anxiety. So of course, as development continues and expresses, then all of those anxiety-provoking moments in development are going to be based on how mom managed anxiety early on, pre-verbal. Mm -hmm. And that's what gets communicated. Mm -hmm. So that by the time it's um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a little boy and I'm a year old and I put on mommy's dress. I already know how mommy manages anxiety. That's already, that's what's giving me that sense that I might be annihilated. So, um, yeah. Thank you. So let me just ask one quick question yeah. too. The baby's fantasies, are they erotic? I mean, I, I always wonder about this because if the inner life, if the, if the depth um, archetypal life is erotic in adult, is it erotic in the, in the, in the early infant stage? I'm still, I'm still kind of in this pre-edible early mirroring. So I'm trying to say, is the baby's fantasies, are they erotic in your opinion? I mean, in, in, your, understanding, in your understanding of... What? Because I would guess they are. Yeah, well, I would guess they are. really, and really, fact, really are. Gonna, in fact, just, first of all, how are you going to talk? What's erotic? Like erotic and pre erotic is different. Probably is less focused. <coughs> it's a more like oral. Or it's oral, erotically oral, or uh, anally erotic. Yeah. Okay, so there's a lot of eroticness going on in these exchanges, right? Oh, definitely. Okay. Definitely. If it, yeah. Because that helps. Trying to happen, trying to happen, depending on the level of damage and, and uh, trauma. Right. But that doesn't okay. necessarily mean it's sexual. I mean, like physically sexual. No. no, no. no. Meaning uh, it's stimulating. It's pleasurable. Highly sensual. Highly sensual. Highly sensual. Yeah. And in fact, in fact, sure, um, talks about the function of the mommy baby gaze as if it's working right then the mommy is helping the baby develop greater and greater uh, capacity for pleasure and excitement in yes, the body. Yes. Even orgasmic uses the word orgasmic okay. in the baby. Okay. And that breastfeeding can be orgasmic okay. in the baby. And that, but that particularly, once you get to be uh, old enough so that the gaze is, becomes important, and it, which is how the the self kind of comes online, that that is about pleasure. That's about building up a capacity for pleasure in the baby. Okay. You know yeah. what is interesting? This happens, if we're talking about gay in particular, it happens within a mother, which is a feminine figure. If the father doesn't play in, so it goes back to the idea of the devil, which has, the mother has both aspects of it. I don't know, it just dawned on me that the mother is capable of doing both. Whether it's straight or gay, she has to be able to tune into both aspects of her child because the, gay, the, the, the little boy could be male or female. So it's always a mother who does this 
function, if you will. That's very interesting. I don't know why I thought of it. I'm not the either. mother doing the basic mirroring function. Regardless of the agenda of the child. The, the stimulating and the regardless of the angels. sexual orientation. So if you have a gay son, you have you still have a a, a a woman doing the mirroring with being able to do it through the double, the idea of the double, that you still have a capability to connect with this boy in a feminine in a masculine sort of way to meet his needs, which would be to be with men, right? Just yeah, she would, yeah, presumably she right on it. She be. Presumably she's imagining like, look at my exciting little, look at my little gay boy, look at my little gay baby. But she would have to get in touch with the masculine part of it to feel that need, otherwise she wouldn't feel that role. Just it's trippy. It's intense to feel it. <laughs> okay. Let's see. So, um, let's see. That was my uh, attachment. Attachment. I wanted to say something about attachment theory. Um, you know, I'm supposed to, you, everybody says Boldy, but I like to say Ainsworth because Mary Ainsworth, you know, really worked with him and is the one who really came up with the studies and actually the one to prove all of this stuff. She really did it. And then Mary Main, there were all these women involved in developing attachment theory. So we originally had Bowlby on the silly somewhere, and I changed it to Ainsworth. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, uh, one of the things I want to say here, um, you know, okay, so attachment theory, through observing, um, just to summarize it really briefly, that um, 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 through observing infants and their mothers, or infants and their parents, actually, individually, in, in certain situations that were constructed in a kind of a lab, um, they were able to identify uh, four different categories of attachment that um, babies have to their uh, caregivers. And um, attachment is a need, a, a developmental need. Uh, babies need to attach to, the, to their parent, and they will. This is like the example of you know, the, the parent who's incredibly abusive, but the child won't let go and wants to be with the abusive parent, because the child will attach, regardless of the quality of the parenting. Because it's a physiological. Uh, developmental need survival, for and it's survival, yeah. But which Bowlby, you know, he basically developed this by looking at primates and at primates um, that the the, way, the the babies of primates and we come from primates would, in order to be safe when there was danger, would you know attach onto they, they would attach onto the mother and most other most other species um, would ha have a place that they go for safety, mm -hmm. but we go to a person. And what he became interested in what happens if the person you go to is also the source of the danger. Mm -hmm. That's the dilemma for a, for um, a child. And um, depending on the severity of the, you know, again, I want to just I want to just you know suggest what happens when the you know at whatever age the lesbian child is like moving toward the parent and is getting this kind of um, non-reflective. Uh, gay is what happens. But anyways, the, 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 um, through, they identified four different styles of attachment. One is called secure attachment, where the baby, where the child can just go to the parent, feels really comfortable, is safe and everything. Um, avoidant attachment, where the baby completely acts when the parent leaves the room, the baby and comes back, the, ba the, the, the baby acts like, who gives a shit? This person could drop dead and I don't care. Um, um, uh, there's another one. I always want to call it anxious <coughs> insecure. insecure. Well, these are both insecure, avoidant, and I want to call it anxious, but a, ambivalent. Ambivalent. Thank you. Ambivalent attachment, where it's that's more like an anxiety kind of situation. The baby like kind of tries to go to the parent, but isn't quite sure and can't quite get can't, can't get settled and can't quite figure it out. And then there's something called disorganized attachment, where the parent. Um, where the, the baby actually engages it and it is really, it's chaotic. It's like it looks okay and then all of a sudden the baby will like freeze and be like this for like 30 seconds and then go on their way or do kinds of weird eyeball rolling, like weird strange things showing there's like chaos going on. 